You're listening to the Good Question Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Our goal is to make each of our guests exclaim, hmm, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Because when that happens, it means you, the listener, may be inspired to learn more beyond the interview and to ask great questions yourself that lead to new insights. In this podcast, we cover historical and current anthropology, comparative religion, and history. Welcome, and let's get started. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Good Question Podcast. My guest today is Carol Inger. She's a postdoctoral fellow in the molecular lab at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And we're going to talk about uh, urban coyotes. Unfortunately, when I think of coyotes, I think of, you know, people that bring other people across the border or all kinds of other weird things. I guess the cartoon of, you know, Wiley Coyote and all that. But um, living in Texas, I've heard some coyotes at night in my neighborhood, and uh, I am curious about them. So I'm glad to talk to him about them with uh, with Carol. So welcome. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here. I do want to mention I did move on from the molecular lab at the Bronx Zoo. I'm actually an educator. I teach students about DNA now. I fell in love with genetics during my graduate studies and the postdoc, and now I teach that to students, to middle and high schoolers. Oh, very nice. Yeah. I'm also a Texan. I am also I'm from Dallas. So uh, I also grew up you know, knowing about coyotes and hearing about them. And I was very interested in studying them once I got to New York. I didn't, just like everyone else, I didn't realize there were coyotes here. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. Where are they in New York? I'm from uh, Long Island, you know, like Queens. But uh, where are they at? Like way out on the island or what? They, they're making their way to Long Island uh, right now. New York City was kind of their last uh, place to expand their range. So they weren't always from the east. They are actually from the Midwest and the western parts of the United States. We had wolves here in the east that kind of, you know, kept coyotes away extirpated the wolves, there was this whole new niche that was open for the coyotes to make their way across the United States. And that happened over time. Generations after generations just kind of made their way over to the east over about 100 or 200 years. And New York City was kind of, you know, they're one of the last places to colonize. And now Long Island <laughs> is the last place in the continental U.S. The coyotes are not uh, not established yet, but you do have these there in Long Island. And there's the people I collaborated with, the Gotham Coyote Project, they're actually studying the Long Island coyotes to see where they are, how many there are, and what are they eating there as well. Oh, I mean, maybe it sounds weird or, or ignorant, but what's the difference between a coyote and a wolf? Uh, coyotes are smaller and they're uh, omnivores, whereas wolves are strictly carnivores. Uh, but coyotes, you know, their diet is more like your dog. They can eat anything pretty much. They also, they're less of a that pack that you think of with a wolf pack. Coyotes, they tend to live in family groups, but it's less of that pack mentality. They don't really hunt as a pack usually they are more in, it's like a more fluid dynamic where they will go they will hunt for food on their own and then come back to the family group later on so that's kind of the similarities another thing about the eastern coyotes is that they do have some wolf dna uh, because there were some hybridizations as coyotes were making their way over to the east they did encounter some wolves in canada and there were some hybridizations and so today's eastern coyotes actually have some wolf dna and actually some dog dna because coyotes wolves and dogs can all interbreed. I've heard it be called Canis supus <laughs> because they can all interbreed. They don't usually because they're very behaviorally different. But if you only have, you know, a few animals in a few in a certain location, that it does happen. There is, you might hear occasionally the term koi wolf. And that's kind of, just, I've heard that being described, the Eastern coyotes being described as koi wolves. But that's kind of a misnomer because there's not really 50%, you know, each coyotes and wolves. It's not like a, a new hybridization. It's just that coyotes carry that wolf DNA from hybrids that happened generations ago. What they, about their person? personalities and their hunting and methods, you know, how do they differ from wolves versus uh, like a pack of wild dogs or, or, or hyenas? Or... Mainly it's just because they hunt on their own. You know, you, you don't often see coyotes hunting together. You know, they are usually by themselves when they get food. And it's more of the smaller animals for coyotes as opposed to wolves who could take down, you know, a whole deer. Coyotes stick with, you know, animals like rabbits or raccoons or mice. So smaller type of animals that they can take, you know, they can get themselves. They don't need a pack to help them take down a bigger animal. So that's the main difference between coyotes and wolves. Just more like they're more individualistic. And behaviorally wise, coyotes are more individualistic. They have, you know, a lot of studies have shown that, you know, you can't really say one single thing about coyotes. Like each coyote is kind of its own individual and they make 
you know, their own choices. So it's hard to say, you know, to really pinpoint coyotes do this, coyotes do that because they're such of this like plastic behavior. They're so adaptable and they're, you know, they're just so smart at adapting to their situations that each coyote is kind of, it's different. You know, it's, it has its own personality almost and it does, it makes different choices. Whereas wolves. Does anyone uh, have as pets or anything or can they be domesticated and want them to be? Maybe. Yeah, it's, it's- flea-bitten troublemakers or something. Yeah, I think that's more of the case. I think it's happened. I think people have had them as pets, but they're not they're not good as pets. You know, they will display, you know, coyote behaviors and they really can't be domesticated as far as I know. Interesting. So where do they tend to go? I mean, do they, like how close do they live to uh, human development? You know, are they very close? They just come out at night or on garbage night to eat stuff? Like what happens? They live close to us, but they have to be able to hide. You know, it's like in New York City, we have big parks. You know, we don't often think of how much park space and green space we have here. But we have Pelham Bay Park and Van Cortland Park are two really big parks with a lot of green spaces, but that's in the middle of human development. So they can live by us you know, but you don't see them. They're hiding within the parks. They like to stay away from humans. They still have that fear of humans. And, you know, they kind of hide in the trees and just you, they'll only be active at dawn and at dusk uh, or their main. That's the main time that they're active. Yeah, they they're scared of us. And it's good for us to keep them scared of us. We don't want to you know encourage behaviors where they actually come out to meet us. Like we don't want to feed them. We don't want to encourage any behaviors like that, because then you can get into trouble with, you know, coyotes starting to bite you, you know, because they're used to food, but they have a natural fear of humans. And so even though they can live near us, you know, they stay away. I've only seen a coyote once in New York City, and that's because I knew where to go and I had to leave at 4 (laughs) a.m. to go and and look at it. But uh, otherwise, you really don't see them that much. Well, how do you observe them for study? I mean, uh, do people take them in and raise them or like what what happens? Really, the ways to study coyotes are using camera traps where you put up a camera around a tree and it's Mm. a motion sensor and you just get, you get pictures pictures that way. The way I studied them was I looked at their fecal samples. So I didn't have to actually go and look at any coyotes. I just studied their genetics from looking at their poop, basically. It's very hard to actually study the behavior of coyotes because it's very hard to get near them. So you can kind of study them from a distance. I mean, I guess no one's able to study them up close. What about, uh, you know, are there any zoos or game parks that have them where they could be observed? Oh, that's true. Yeah, actually, yeah, in zoos or game parks, you could do that. If it's a captive population, you could definitely study their behavior that way. And there's also scientists that... What about tagging them, like... Yes, knocking that's them out that's and yes. tagging them and stuff, you know? Exactly. Yeah. There's actually a long running project in Chicago and the PI, uh, Stan Gert, has been studying them for generations and that he does a lot of the tagging, the putting GPS collars and actually has video of them. He'll put GoPros on the coyotes to kind of see where they go. So that's a great way to study them as well. Yeah. Yes, they should be called GoCos, you know, GoKai instead of GoPros. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's cool. Any interesting observations that uh, that he's had of watching them for so long? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I, I'd have to look into his research to see it. A lot of actually his research I put into my PhD studies. He kind of combined a lot of the research that had been obtained about urban coyotes. And there's a few things we know, you know, like I told you before, it's hard to really pin down, you know, what do we know about urban coyotes? Because they're all so different. But there are a few things that he was able to figure out. So coyotes in urban areas, they tend to be more, more active at night, like I, what I was saying, to avoid avoid humans and they tend to you know stay away from the developed areas so they try to stay away from sidewalks or you know any areas where humans would be and if they are in those areas they tend to move faster to get to those more naturalistic areas i did actually collaborate with the the gotham coyote project here that's just a a collaboration of different scientists that are studying coyotes and they did manage to put some uh, gps collars on a few of the coyotes here and monitor them for about i think about a year and they did find that those coyotes stayed within the naturalistic areas too and they didn't go into the urbanized like residential zones which was good it's it's good to hear because i think that's when the coyotes could get themselves into trouble if they're running into humans and people see them at all times of the day so it's good that they were kind of staying away and just using those natural areas well what are you hoping to learn about them that's not already known well i was happy to be a part of the diet study i got to use the genetics to see what they were eating and uh, i actually wanted to see what human food they were eating i was really curious about so i i was able to find out that they're mostly eating naturalistic foods here in the city so that was great to, to find out. Uh, like rabbits, uh, raccoons, uh, deer, which they're probably scavenging from the parks. And, but I also thought it was really interesting the human food they're eating. They're eating chicken is the most common human food that I found. And that is all over the parks. 
I do see chicken bones everywhere. So it makes sense that the chicken lovers. Yeah, because we eat so much chicken as just humans. We eat it's all over the human diet. So it makes sense that they're opportunistic, opportunistically picking that up. And then I found things like rice and I found like what else? Some meat items that I just figured were from human, like uh, I think ham, you know, and they're not going to find a pig <laughs> in the city. Um, things like olive and chickpea. So I thought, oh, maybe it was visiting a halal cart. <laughs> um, so it was interesting to find that out and it, it does make sense because they are opportunistic so they're just opportunistically just finding those diet items that we're leaving out do they eat rats uh, no, you know they're when they're not around not is it uh like when they're around like is there any benefit or would that well i was hoping to find that they ate rats because that would be a great service but i only found rats in a few of their draw of their scats so they don't seem to be a big consumer of rats unfortunately i think they will eat them but it's not really a preferred diet what about pigeons Pigeons. Like delicious yes. New York pigeons. Yeah. They tended to like pigeons. <laughs> so I did find the birds in the diet and pigeons were the most widely eaten bird. So they definitely take out the pigeons. I'm sure that any slow pigeons or any pigeons they can just scavenge, they're already dead. So yes, they do. <laughs> they do eat pigeons. I also looked at domestic cats because a lot of the, the studies from other urban areas like Los Angeles, they study the coyotes there. They found that cats are, are a big part of the diet. But here, I only found a few cats. So they're not eating the feral cats in New York City, for better or for worse, it's good or bad. <laughs> so. Yeah, but how do they reliably get ham, turkey, chicken, all that stuff? I mean, like, what's the major thing you found? Is it is it really chicken? Like, will they go days and so they could find chicken somewhere? Or like, where are they all this food? I really think it's just opportunistically. They're in the parks and I think they're just, if they see it, they'll eat it. But they can reliably get wild animals. They can get raccoons. They can get rabbits you know, squirrels. So there's plenty of things that they can eat, like moles, things like that. And yeah, there's just a ton of naturalistic food items. So they don't need our human food. That's what I wanted to see. Are they relying on our human food? But it doesn't seem like they are. They're just opportunistically getting it. And if we secured our trash better, they would just stick to the naturalistic, the animals that they're already eating. What happens in the, like where in the country have coyotes been for a long time? And there's a whole lot of them. And, you know, we're able to see the effects they have on their environment. Like, what's their place in the environment that you've seen? Uh, it seems to be there. Um, there's a lot of talk, you know, are they like an apex predator? And it does seem like they are the top predator in the United States because we don't have wolves. So they do seem to be the you know, predator here. They kind of, they didn't totally take over the wolf niche because they, they can't take down the bigger animals. Like a coyote can't take down deer, you know, live deer. So they haven't replaced wolves in that regard, but they too tend to be the top predator in at least in urban areas because in more rural areas, you have things like mountain lions. They can take down bigger, bigger animals. But in urban areas, coyotes are the top dog, the, the top predator here. Interesting. So again, I don't know, do they seem to have any beneficial role or they're just there and they're eating stuff and, and hanging out, but they don't really disturb the ecosystems they're in or change them very much? Yeah, I don't think they really disturb them. I think they just kind of kind of fit right in. Like here in New York City, they actually ate a lot of raccoons. So they may be, you know, able to uh, kind of regulate the raccoon population. And it, that's actually pretty good since raccoons can uh, carry um, things like rabies and other diseases. So that might be a, a good way that they can kind of regulate the ecosystem that way. Take out any, you know, to kind of regulate those animals that didn't really have anyone before. Raccoons are pretty big. There really was no other animal that could consume them, you know. So I think that's what they, they can do in urban areas like New York City. Yeah, I remember years ago we went to San Diego and went to this hotel that you know, all the rooms like exited into the central courtyard with lots of plants. And we saw like a big raccoon sitting on the garbage eating a pizza. And I remember oh, we were like, yeah. yeah, it's funny. All these animals, they just, they seem to be just opportunistic. Like, like um, in Arizona, once I was visiting a friend and I came home late at night and there was all these javelinas, these wild pigs that were in the street. You know, it was garbage night and they came down from the mountain and they knocked over all the garbage cans and like the mother would knock over the garbage cans. The babies would rush in and eat it. Oh, wow. So I, yeah, I've seen all kinds of weird stuff. Like we had a porcupine in our yard the other night. It was weird. It just, you know, I don't know what it was doing. And then it climbed the fence and just walked off into the night. And there's all kinds of crazy stuff that happens. You know, we've seen possums or raccoons and everything. That's amazing. I can't believe Havelina. It's a big animal. <laughs> yeah, they're like, well, they're the size of like, you know, like a 30, 40 pound dog. Oh, okay. A little bit bigger. <laughs> Yeah, they smell very musky. And it was just funny that they were going through the garbage, you know, the mother, the babies and everything. Oh, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah, we really do affect the behavior of a lot of different species by leaving out our trash. Yeah, it's wow. weird. 
So what are you hoping to figure out about coyotes, like uh, zero in more on their diet or like what, what are you trying to learn about them? I would love to learn more about how they're, you know, moving around uh, the cities. It is so hard to get, you know, GPS collars on them. I'd love to see more research on, you know, how are they moving through New York City? Because we know that in the city we have coyotes in most of the parks here and they're in Bronx. They're, they move through Manhattan and they go, we know they're in uh, in Queens. But we have no idea, like, how do they get from, you know, the Bronx or Manhattan over to Queens? You, know, we, you go to the BQE, uh, take the bridge. You know? I think maybe, you know, they can <laughs> swim. So that's a possibility. We actually, there is footage, if you Google it, of uh, a coyote being rescued from the water because it was swimming. Uh, so you just wow. don't know how they got there. But and. I would love to know how they're moving through, you know, let's say the Bronx into Manhattan, things like that, you know. So that would be interesting. I'd also love to see a diet study what because we all we all use different methods in our diet study. So I used genetics. Other people they use microscopes and they visualize leftover remnants and I'm sure we we get different results depending on the method we use. I think it'd be really interesting to do a really big diet study of a, a couple of different cities using the same method and really comparing the diets of coyotes in the different cities like New York City and Chicago and LA and just, you know, to see if those differences are because we're using different methods or are they actually eating such different foods? I think that would be really interesting to study. But their uh, their calls, their howls, you know, as opposed to wolves. Yeah, they do they have the the yip call. I'm sure you you probably heard of it when you're in Texas. Texas, right? Yeah, they go. Whoa. Yeah, the yep. I think there's a study that they concluded that that it's so powerful when you hear that. It just it's so loud. Kind of scary it, too. It like tells you, like, oh shit. Yeah. You're like, what is? How many coyotes are there? I've heard that they do that to kind of see like how many are in the area. Like it's like a call and response. You know, see how many coyotes. In addition to that one family group, are there others in the area? So that's kind of that's what I've heard is the point of all the yipping to make get a consensus or a, a census of what's in the area. Hmm. But yeah, kind of freaky to hear that. So you really haven't had much ability to like hang out with one or observe one or no. pet them or anything. no, I can't tell you much about coyote behavior because I only have seen their pictures on camera traps and I've seen their genetics. So what I know is just from what I've read in the literature. But what have you seen in their genetics, like uh, compared to wolf DNA, dog DNA, you know, other creatures? I don't know too much about like the genes they have that are different. It's mainly I do know about like the, what I told you before about the eastern coyote having the mixture. It's about 80% coyote DNA and then they have about 10% wolf DNA and 10% dog DNA. But no, I don't know that much about the genes that distinguish coyotes, wolves, and dogs. But I do know, talking about genetics of the three, I know that uh, my collaborators, they studied the New York City coyote population, and they realized that there is some dog DNA, some recent dog DNA that's in our coyote population. So they are interbreeding with some dogs. So that's kind of interesting. And I think there's more research to be had in terms of genes. Like, are are those hybrids, are they going to get some dog genes that maybe make them more used to humans, you know, something like that. But it's all interesting. Well, if they're able to successfully interbreed with dogs, uh, you know, I would think, yeah. 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 What are those genes? that are going to come through? Are they going to be, you know, what kind of dog genes? You know, it would be interesting. I'm sure it'll be studied and I can't wait to hear what the results are. Okay. Well, very good. Where can people find out more about, you know, your work with coyotes and learn more about them? I have a website. I need to update it, but I have a website. It is carolhinger.com. So C-A-R-O-L-H-E-N-G-E-R.com. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Carol, thanks for coming on the podcast and I hope that you're able to, uh, you know, learn quite a bit more about them and observe them soon. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Good Question Podcast. Please email support at the Good Question Podcast.com if you have any referrals to great guests for us to interview. Visit the Good Question Podcast.com to hear more interviews. And please help us spread the word by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to this podcast. 